Hey there, everybody. This is your host, Michelle Ann Olson, and you are listening to Are You Afraid of the Bark? The podcast that goes bark in the night. Hi, I'm so happy to be talking to you right now. This is episode nine of Are You Afraid of the Bark? Finally, as you know, I have been battling the world's most irksome, impossible bout case of laryngitis. I got sick three weeks ago with a cold that was like the cold to end all colds, just a death cold. Actually, it became referred to as the death cold of 2018 by other friends and colleagues who had it. And this cold just decimated my voice. Like I'm talking the kind of laryngitis where I couldn't even produce sound. And it was super frustrating because I had to miss a bunch of work. And then I went on holiday with my family to New York City and couldn't talk in New York. And then I came back to work at the beginning of October. What are we now? Like October 17th. Came back at the beginning of October, back to work, where I use my voice all day. I'm an educator. I'm talking to guests. I'm interpreting information about our animals at the aquarium. I'm in the classroom teaching modules about conservation and biology, using my voice nonstop, which meant that this is the best my voice has been in three weeks. So I'm going to try not to overdo it tonight, but I'm finally well enough to bring you episode nine that I've been sitting on for the past three weeks. I'm sorry for not releasing an episode. I'm sorry for teasing this material for forever. It's been driving me crazy. I've wanted to record and not been able to, and people have been asking where the next episode is, and it's been frustrating. So I apologize for my absence. I think I'm back. Like, I'm back now with episode 9, and hopefully next week, next Wednesday with episode 10, and then hopefully we're back on track just in time for Halloween. Which, by the way, October is my absolute favorite time of year. I love Halloween, and this harks back to my days as a haunted tour guide. Halloween is our Christmas. It's just the busiest time of year with like new and exciting tours, extra spooky. We dial up, you know, the scares, the frights in our stories. I love this time of year. My apartment is decked out in the best Halloween decorations that Dollarama has to offer. Just like every nook and cranny with like little plastic pumpkins and creepy looking glow in the dark cats, like black cats. I don't know if you're an SNL fan. I am. I bought these little pop Funko figurines of David S. Pumpkins and his dancing skeletons. Anyway, I love Halloween. And Halloween is the best time of year to tell these scary stories. So it's just been killing me that I've not been able to record. All of that to say, hello, Thank you for tuning in. I'm not at 100%, but this is what you're getting, and I'm excited to be back. I have missed telling these stories and recording this podcast and interacting with you and finding out what you think of the stories week to week. I've missed you. Just know that. Just know that I missed you while I was away. So, this episode 9, originally when it was meant to be published, it was going to be published the week I left for New York City with my family, which was at the end of September. And we had this great few days in New York. So this episode, the myths and legends, the animal myths and legends of New York City, it was going to be super thematic as I left on my trip. Of course, it's less relevant now, but know that I've given a lot of thought to this episode in these past weeks. And I've also tried to bolster my stories with sort of Yeah, it's just a sound from outside. I turned out all the lights and, you know, naturally I'm spooked by my own shadow, as per usual. Yeah, I've tried to bolster these stories with some sort of bonus material to make up for being away for so long. So let's delve into some of the animal myths and legends of New York City with special bonus content to thank you for your patience and to apologize for being away for so long. Starting right off the bat with some of the animal legends of New York City. Being in New York a few weeks ago, 
I was sort of extra aware this time around of the presence of animals in the city. It being such an incredibly urban landscape and just wall-to-wall packed with people, I didn't expect to notice the amount of animal life that I did while I was there. And there is animal life everywhere you look in the city. There were squirrels and pigeons and yeah, rats, vermin. But also I found out that New York City houses the world's most healthy population of peregrine falcons because housing their nests in skyscrapers makes them immune to predators. They're so high up. While they use the thermals that rise from the city's pavement to virtually expend no energy and have sort of this infinite food source in the form of mice and rats and other vermin. So this city full of people, if you look close enough, there is also animal life everywhere. And of course, we know this in Toronto, where I'm from. Not where I'm from, sorry. God, I can't believe I said that. But where I currently live, I'm from Ottawa, by the way, um... Where I currently live, Toronto, I mean, yeah, we have animal life everywhere. We're known as the capital city of raccoons. There are just raccoons everywhere to the point where the Toronto raccoon has become its own legend. The animal legends of New York City are synonymous with the city itself. I think that the city is more than just its human population and its human history. So one of these legends that's very well known is that of the New York City sewer alligator. This, of course, being the legend, the myth, that alligators live in the sewer system below New York City, and that from time to time, these alligators crop up through manholes or, more alarmingly, through your toilet to wreak havoc. So let's take a look at that legend. Let's start by examining the legend of the sewer alligator of New York City. Now we can trace this panic or this idea of the sewer alligator back to a news article that appeared in the New York Times in 1935, and it had the headline, Alligator Found in Uptown Sewer. And this is a real article that appeared in the New York Times about several individuals who caught and killed an eight-foot alligator found in an open manhole at 123rd Street and the Harlem River. Oh, here we go. Here is the sort of extended headline and subline. Quote, Alligator found in uptown sewer. Youth shoveling snow into manhole see the animal churning in icy water. This is in all capitals. Snare it and drag it out. Reptile slain by rescuers when it gets vicious. Whence it came is mystery. That's all part of the headline and sort of sublines of this article. The origins of this myth are not myth. They are based in history, in an actual occurrence. And experts in New York City or experts in animal and urban life say that the alligator in the sewer isn't so far-fetched an idea to this day. So apparently in the 1920s and 1940s, a lot of rich individuals in New York were bringing back exotic pets and animals from abroad. And the common version of the sewer alligator legend blames those people for flushing their baby alligators down the toilet when they got too big or too unruly. But it's more unlikely that those individuals dumped their unwanted pets into sewer grates and manholes. Now, according to one Fran Capo, who wrote a book called The Myths and Mysteries of New York, there have been about a dozen sightings of alligators in the sewers over the years, but you would need so many more to have a reproducing, thriving colony below the city streets. That isn't to say that it doesn't happen from time to time that a sewer alligator makes itself known above ground. Just four years ago, a writer found herself, and the uh, New York Post article that I'm quoting says that she found herself face to snout with an alligator on a side street in Queens. So this is what she described. Quote, There it was on the wet asphalt, crouching motionless. I thought of my dog, poised to hunt, and wondered if the gator's stillness was a prelude to lunging for the ankle of one of its hecklers, end quote. It turns out that the myth, the legend of the New York City sewer alligator is not 
so much a myth. Maybe the myth is that there are, you know, hundreds of them below the city streets, this this reproducing, self-sustaining colony. That's not the case, but for the individual gator to turn up from time to time, from the 1930s until now, that's true. It seems that New Yorkers even view the alligator myth as a source of pride. So every 9th of February is the city's annual Alligators in the Sewers Day. The event was launched on the 75th anniversary of the 1935 sighting by a historian named Michael Mischione, and he claims that he created the holiday not to poke fun at the myth, but to emphasize its veracity. Quote, the concept of alligators in city sewers is a great myth, and having done a little research on it, I found that it has a strong basis in reality. I felt people should know that. End quote. So at one of the recent iterations of Alligators in the Sewers Day in Manhattan, there were speakers and a trivia, and the first 100 guests received a free plastic baby alligator. So... Yeah, turns out that that particular New York City animal myth is, in fact, true. And I love the idea, isn't it so like New Yorkers to seize that idea and just absolutely own it and make it a proud part of their city's history. Moving to another more recent animal myth out of New York City and the surrounding area. This is slightly more sinister and came out of a more recent tragedy. And this is the idea of the super rats of Hurricane Sandy. This is the belief that when Hurricane Sandy hit the New York shore in 2012, that it killed, and it is true that the hurricane killed, many, many, many hundreds of rats and other animals who were sort of unable to flee the pounding waves, they're like the rising waters, but The idea of the super rat is that the rats that were able to outsmart or outrun the storm were in some way genetically, maybe intellectually superior, and that they have propagated to produce the super rat, which is an extra intelligent rat able to overcome adversity and present a real sort of adversary to the humans of New York City. So this story in particular, again, I got from the New York Post, and it's the story of a 20-something man from New York City named Kevin. Now, Kevin, it is noted in the Post article, asked that his last name be withheld so that his co-workers don't shame him for having a rodent problem. But basically, he claims that he and his roommates were living in a fifth-floor loft somewhere in New York City, and they barely had a cockroach, like just a quite clean fifth-story residence. But then, the winter after Hurricane Sandy, the noises began, the scratching and the sound of scurrying. So Kevin says, quote, I walked into the kitchen one day and saw a rat the size of a small cat crawling across our food shelves. Disgusting. End quote. Now, according to Kevin, they called in the usual exterminators, they set out the usual traps, but they were ineffective against these rats. First of all, that they could find their way into the fifth floor apartment at all. Secondly, that their many attempts to defeat the rats and to remove them from their apartment proved fruitless. It took them weeks to get rid of the rats, even with professional help. And Kevin believes that the rats seem to get smarter by the day, able to outsmart the latest trap or efforts by the exterminators. So yeah, he claims that these were some sort of genetically superior rat. Although, according to experts, and I'm quoting a rat expert named Robert Sullivan, the likelihood of Sandy breeding super rats is the same as Bigfoot. Sandy killed a lot of rats, both big and small ones would have drowned. And yet, Kevin insists that these were not your normal rats, that all the weaker rats had been wiped out by Hurricane Sandy, and that the surviving rodents had bred a new generation of tougher, meaner rats. Kevin did eventually evict his unwanted tenants from his apartment. He accidentally captured the last rat by cooking it while preheating his oven. And he says, quote, The smell of burning rat hair remained in our apartment for days. 
and I live in fear of their return, end quote. So the super rat may be more a myth than our sewer alligators, believe it or not. But this is the stuff of nightmares. When Hurricane Sandy struck, it did kill so many animals. And this was an actual headline in a New York newspaper. Bloated bodies washing up after the storm. Regardless of the existence of the super rat, Hurricane Sandy certainly did wreak havoc on New York's animal population. Now, my next story is... To be perfectly honest, a bit of a mistake on my part, what I'm going to call a bonus story in this episode to apologize for coming at you so late and to thank you for sticking with me. I initially started researching a cemetery in New York called Woodland Cemetery. It's in Brooklyn, and I started researching it because I had heard that this cemetery featured a haunting by a young boy and his dog. But the more I looked into Woodland Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York, the more I realized that this had been a typo in one of my resources, and that that haunting takes place in Woodland Cemetery, which is not in New York. So Woodland Cemetery is in Dayton, Ohio. I was going to drop this whole story because Woodland Cemetery in Brooklyn does not have any purported animal hauntings, but am going to include this story again as a sort of thank you apology. So briefly about Woodland Cemetery in Brooklyn. It's known as Garden Cemetery and it is the resting place for about 300,000 people. It is haunted, though by human ghosts rather than animal ghosts. One particular specter that's been reported by multiple people is that of an unknown man, and he appears to be crazed and yelling with a flashlight. He's waving his flashlight around, but no one can hear what he's saying. They only see him. They see his sort of agitation, but nobody can hear the words that he's screaming. Wood Lawn Cemetery, again in Brooklyn, is also home to many of the Titanic's passengers who were laid to rest, those who perished from the Titanic tragedy, and there is a commemorative tour of, like, sort of the history of the Titanic sinking and the fact that many of the bodies were brought to New York. The survivors, of course, arrived eventually in New York on the Carpathia. There's a tour you can take of that history at the Woodland Cemetery in Brooklyn. But let's go ahead and travel temporarily to Ohio, to Woodland Cemetery, and bring you that story of that young boy and his dog. The name of that boy is Johnny Morehouse, and his is probably the most famous grave in Woodland Cemetery in Ohio. So Johnny drowned in the mid-1800s, and there are many stories about his dog's death as it relates to his. So one of those stories is that Johnny's dog jumped in the river and drowned trying to save him, and the family was so moved by his loyalty to the boy that they had the grave marker sculpted of him and Johnny. And it's true that the grave is beautiful. It's true that the grave of Johnny Morehouse features a sculpture of him and his dog standing proudly over his body, protectively over his body. And this grave is very frequently visited and covered in flowers and other items of memorial and disrespect, I guess. So the other story is that Johnny Morehouse's dog tried to save the boy, but lived to mourn his failed attempt and then spent every day sleeping curled up on Johnny's grave. When the dog died, he was buried with the boy, and then the monument was built to commemorate the dog's dedication. Stories have circulated for years about the boy and his dog walking the cemetery at night. There's even a story from someone living near the cemetery calling the police because they saw the young boy and dog walking the cemetery alone in the dark. But, typically enough, the police found no trace of the boy or dog when they arrived etched on the side of the monument and it's beautiful again the dog stands over the boy in this protective loving stance 
The words on the side of the monument are slumber sweet. So today, as I said, the monument is adorned with toys, coins, and trinkets. Some say it's for luck, others say it's just tradition. But there's rumors that a woman goes to the cemetery every morning to gather the coins and then uses the money to buy more trinkets for Johnny. And apparently one of the groundskeepers at Woodland says that there's a warehouse full of the trinkets that have been left at his grave over the years. So a story and a haunting that have struck a chord at this cemetery in Ohio. Initially I wasn't going to tell that story, but it was almost too, too sweet not to tell. It brings me back to that episode, I think it was episode 4, about just good dogs. Dogs who would do anything for their owners in life and death. I'm glad that they're together after their death. It can bring some comfort to one another, you know? So let's travel back then to New York. Now, when I was in New York, I did this wonderful walking tour with my family. We are big musical theater people, and we were going incredibly to see the Broadway production of Hamilton, which was amazing. Hamilton is every bit as amazing as everybody says it is. I'm sure you're tired of hearing about it, but when it comes to your city, go see it because you will feel like electrified. It's amazing. So anyway, we were there to see Hamilton. That was like our primary reason for being there. And we ended up doing this spectacular walking tour called Hamilton's New York. And the guy who delivered this tour was incredible. His level of knowledge about American revolutionary history he just talked straight for three hours without taking a breath, and I don't think even began to touch on the level of detailed, intimate knowledge that he has about this period in American history. We saw all sorts of cool things, like a pub frequented by Washington and Hamilton. We went to Trinity Church, where Hamilton is buried. It was great. I love a good walking tour. As a tour guide, I hoped to like show people a different side of Ottawa and I think that walking tours and a good tour guide are the best way to get to know a city you're traveling in. Hopefully they are engaging and passionate about their city and you get to see a side that you're not necessarily going to see just walking around or like with a guide map. So anyway, on this tour we're talking about American Revolutionary history and the topic of war horses came up. The horses who fueled the American Revolutionary War. I just wanted to mention these horses briefly as an aspect of New York's history that maybe isn't talked about so much, as an aspect of revolutionary history that maybe isn't talked about so much. Now, George Washington himself credited his war horses with his victories and performance in these battles in and around New York City in the final days of the American Revolution. And his two horses were called Blueskin and Nelson. So Blueskin is the one that you often see memorialized in pictures of, not pictures, but paintings of Washington because he had striking gray coloring. But Nelson was Washington's preferred horse because he was much less jumpy at the sound of cannon fire. And Nelson carried Washington through much of the Revolutionary War. So he chose to ride Nelson when Lord Cornwallis and the British Army surrendered in 1781. So horses played a huge role in that conflict. But the guide mentioned something that has kind of stuck with me since. The American Revolutionary War, very bloody. People died not only from, you know, cannon fire and musket fire and bayoneting, but so many died from disease and starvation. And these prisoner ships in New York Harbor where the disease and the filth were just incomprehensible. But apparently the one truly haunting thing to so many of the men who survived that conflict, and this has been documented in their memoirs, apparently the haunting thing is the screams of war horses dying when cannon fire and musket fire volleyed into either lines of British or American soldiers. And that fact really on this tour, all about human history, that tiny detail about animals, the way that we use animals, the way that we rely on them, the way that they die for us. What a what a terrible thing that these men were haunted by that sound and what a terrible thing that those horses had to die like that. So I just wanted to mention that because it really, really stuck with me. 
And now I'm going to wrap up this podcast, which is quickly becoming my longest episode ever, with a truly incredible story. And I don't mean incredible like, wow, that's awesome. I mean incredible like, this is somewhat unbelievable. And this is the story of Topsy the Elephant. I posted a somewhat facetious link to an episode of Bob's Burgers a while back. They do a whole episode about Topsy the Elephant where they, the kids produce like a musical about Topsy and it's somewhat historically accurate. It's pretty funny and it's pretty sad. So if you get the chance to check that out, probably my favorite depiction of Topsy in popular culture. It's, you know, it's ridiculous in the style of Bob's Burgers, but I think that the episode does successfully capture some of the pathos of this story and, and some of what makes it so sad. Topsy is one of New York City's most famous animals. Topsy was an elephant born in the 1870s and was brought to the United States to be part of American circuses. So she was part of the Four Paw Circus in 1902 and then was sold to Coney Island's Sea Lion Park. Topsy was involved throughout her life in several well-publicized incidents. Basically, she injured and killed a number of her handlers. And this is probably due to the absolutely atrocious treatment of elephants and circuses to this day. I can only imagine what it was like in the 1900s, and I don't blame Topsy for turning against her handlers. But due to the publicized nature of those incidents, her handlers basically condemned her to death for the murder or the injury of her human handlers. They condemned her to be executed in a public hanging and they wanted to charge admission for spectators because they're not good people. Clearly, they are making profit on the back of animals. It doesn't matter how. So at the time, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the SPCA, objected to the idea of the hanging, saying that it was unnecessarily cruel. The park officials instead opted for a death by poisoning, strangulation, and electrocution. This was going to be quick, purportedly painless, and believe it or not, the SPCA said, all right, if you've got to do it, that's the way. I'll let you know that on January 4th of 1903, Topsy was executed by electrocution, and her execution was filmed, and that film still exists today. But here's the truly remarkable part. Not that the public electrocution of an elephant in New York City isn't remarkable, is the involvement of one Thomas Edison. So Thomas Edison was fighting the battle of currents for the standard of electricity to be used in the U.S. Thomas Edison, we, we credit him with the invention of electricity, but he was fighting Nikola Tesla to basically win the minds and hearts of Americans as to which of their styles of electricity was best. So Edison was fighting for direct current, but Tesla had come up with the more efficient alternating current. So Edison was fighting for DC direct current to be the form of electricity widely used across the United States. So Edison was behind this propaganda war, and he was trying to discourage the use of AC alternating current. He was lobbying Congress and spreading rules and misinformation to show the danger of alternating current compared to his direct current. And how did he do this? He staged public electrocutions of stray and unwanted animals with Tesla's alternating current to show how deadly and dangerous it was. And even though he was an opponent of capital punishment, he commissioned a partner to develop an electric chair using alternating current for the state of New York. Yeah, it's, I'm baffled. This is like an inventor. We hail him as a luminary, haha, <laughs> electricity luminary. And he was, he was killing animals to prove a point about his invention versus his rivals. It's pretty disgusting. So basically, at this point, he's approached by the circus and he decides to demonstrate the dangers of alternating current one more time on the largest animal in the world. He signed on to execute Topsy, and then he would document the whole thing with another one of his inventions, the movie camera. So the owners of the park at Coney Island, they knew that this story had gotten a ton of press, so they initially wanted to charge for the execution of Topsy, but the SPCA was like, no, that's gross. But in the end, people were allowed to attend free of charge. 
to watch this this hugely publicized execution of the world's largest animal discounting the blue whale obviously none of this is based in science all of this is 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 ridiculous anyway they're they're there to watch the electrocution of an elephant because apparently in the early 1900s that is somebody's idea of a good time and they characterize topsy like a convicted killer condemned to death and so in the same way that people would go to watch a hanging they went to watch topsy die 1000 people gathered to watch the spectacle so her old trainer, Whitney Alt, was offered $25 to bring Topsy to her death, but the trainer turned it down, saying that he wouldn't do it for 1000 That makes me really sad. That's someone who was on Topsy's side. Despite her having injured other handlers, clearly her trainer still cared for her. That's really sad. So there was no one who was qualified to bring her to the platform. She wouldn't cross the bridge to the middle of the lagoon in the park, which was undergoing construction at the time. So she wouldn't stand in place. She shook off the electrodes that were hooked to her. Oh, and she refused to eat the cyanide lace carrots that were offered to her as if she knew what was going on. Go figure. Elephants or Topsy was probably smarter than any of these people. But after some coaxing, she finally ate the carrots and the electric switch was thrown. She died almost instantly and also took one of the Edison technicians with her. And he was also electrocuted when he threw the switch. Well, kind of deserves it, but sorry, I'm letting my bias through here. I just, this whole story makes me so sad and so angry. I can't believe, I can't believe that we've gotten away treating animals like this in the past. So even though she was already dead, they then tightened a noose around her neck and hanged her for 10 minutes to be sure. So then the SPCA doctors on site claimed it was the most humane way to kill an animal they had ever seen. And Edison released a documentary film called Electrocuting an Elephant. The first time an actual death was documented on film. That was shown to audiences across the country. You can view it online if you want to, though I would not recommend it. Ultimately, it didn't raise any awareness for animal cruelty or even help his argument against AC. It was all about novelty and entertainment. But Topsy did have the last word, as it was. Her ghost was said to haunt Coney Island following her death. And this comes from a report in the Brooklyn Eagle from the September 1903 edition. Quote, Visitors to Luna Park, Coney Island, have been hearing stories of the repeated appearance of the ghost of an elephant who died six months ago. Topsy, who was aged 36, was rumored to have killed a couple of circus trainers in Texas before arriving at Luna Park. Last year, she crushed one Thomas Blount to death when he stupidly fed her a lit cigarette. Okay, this is like not part of the quote, but like, what the hell, man? Quote, then for a time, Topsy got on well, doing odd jobs at Coney Island, although she would only ever obey her mahout, Willie Alt. Earlier this year, she charged some workmen and it was decided she had to go. Poisoning and shooting were considered too cruel, and so on a Sunday in March, Topsy was made to step on metal plates and electrocuted. Since then, according to the keeper of another elephant, Frank Gummis, the ghost of Topsy has returned twice, to warn other elephants they should leave Coney Island before they suffer the same fate. End quote. Well, good for you, Topsy. Now, luckily, as far as I know, there are no circuses, no elephants on Coney Island anymore. So I don't know that the ghost of Topsy is there anymore either. She doesn't have anybody else to warn of the cruelty of man. So hopefully she and the other elephants forced to live and work for that circus, have moved on to a better place. And that is the incredible story of Topsy the Elephant. In New York City, the electrocution and subsequent haunting of an elephant. Who would have thunk? These animal stories are weirder than I even thought when I started researching them. And that concludes, finally, this episode 9 of Are You Afraid of the Bark? Took me an age to get here, but it's longer than any other episode. I tried to bulk it up with extra, extra stories, and I hope you enjoyed it. I really do. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that you'll come back next week with whatever episode 10 brings us. 
please uh, let me know what you think. Let me know what topics you'd like me to cover in future, especially leading up to Halloween. Like if there's any super spooky topic you'd like me to cover, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to forge ahead, hopefully releasing every Wednesday as I have been. So you can reach out to me in a number of ways. By email, of course, at afraidofthebarkpodcast at gmail.com. Facebook, the page is A-Y-A-O-T-B podcast. Twitter is Afraid of the Bark. And Instagram is Afraid of the Bark podcast. So please reach out any way you like. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you're happy to have me back. Yeah, I mean, you know, my sick self could use the ego boost. Let me know if there's anything you'd like me to cover moving forward. Let me know if you have your own animal ghost stories to share. How great would it be to share some of those in advance of Halloween? So seriously, reach out. I'd love to hear from you. And I think that's it. I think this brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you very much for sticking with me. Thank you for joining me. And as always, I wish you sweet dreams tonight. Thanks for listening. <laughs>